studying the state of the dead, let us get our Bibles out and we're going to answer the question, did the thief on the cross go immediately into heaven? Did the thief on the cross go immediately into paradise as the text seems to say? Amen? Let's find out from the Bible some foundational truths. Let me zoom in for you guys. All right. And so we're going to go to, and many of you are familiar with these texts, but some of you might not be. When I asked you the question, who has immortality, the Bible gives us the answer for that question. And we're going to find that answer in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Amen. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And we're going to read from 14 to 16. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. All right. Verses 14 through 16. Amen. Good evening. Good evening. It's good to see you. So, friends, who alone has immortality? Let's find out the answer here from the Bible, right? So, starting in 1 Timothy chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 14 so we know who we're talking about, right? It says here that you keep this, this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, we know that what follows is about Christ himself, okay? Very simple stuff which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. We know that's talking about Christ. Now read verse 16. You guys let me know in the chat. You guys let me know in the chat. Who alone has immortality according to the scripture? Amen? Amen? It says here, only God has immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen. You see? So how can we say that we have an immortal soul? How can we say that we have an immortal soul when the Bible clearly says we are not immortal? Only God is immortal. So how can we have an immortal soul? That's the question we want to answer. This is a foundational thing we need to discover, friends. Right? Amen? So, where are we going to find in the Bible the definition of what a soul is? You guys let me know in the chat. All right? Where, where can we go in the Bible to find what a soul is? There you go. Hello, Brother Lloyd. It's good to see you. Amen, friends. And we're going to be taking a look at some of these things so that when we read regarding the thief on the cross, which is probably the number one, uh, number one text used by those who believe in the immortality of the soul, right? And we're going to find out that, that what appears to be on the surface is not the case at all. So let's go to Genesis chapter 2. And we're going to look in verse 7. Amen. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. I want you to notice here how clear this statement is right here. Okay? So if I were to write on a board, what would I be writing here? The Lord God formed man how? How are you and I formed? The dust of the ground, which we understand to be our bodies. And what is it that gives us the life that we have, the consciousness, the awareness that we have? It says he breathed into the man's nostrils the breath of life. And what happened? This is very important, friends, because if you don't get this right, you're going to misunderstand many other scriptures in the Bible. What was the result of the dust and the breath? Right? Amen? So we do not see, let me repeat this again, we do not see that man received a living soul. 
Man was not given a living soul. Man became a living soul. So in order for the living soul to exist, the dust of the ground must be united with the breath of life. You see? So what happens to the living soul when the breath goes back to God and the dust goes back to the ground, like Ecclesiastes 12, 7 says, that the dust goes back to the ground and the spirit, which is the breath, goes back to God who gave it. What happens to the living soul? Hey, Linda, good to see you there. And yes, that is correct. We go to sleep, as the Bible says. Nothing happens to the living soul. It ceases to exist. It doesn't go anywhere. Because before the dust and the breath unite, the living soul isn't anywhere. Make sense? So we have already discovered in two texts that we are not immortal, that only God is, and our soul is, is, is us. You are a soul but you are not immortal. Make sense? All right. You guys let me know if this is understandable in your ears tonight. Amen? Amen? You guys let me know. Is this clear? Is this clear? This is from the Holy Bible, not Brother Mike. Okay? You don't have a soul, you don't receive a soul, and your soul is not immortal because you are not immortal, right? Okay. All right, we have some people that don't understand. You need to go back and read this text then prayerfully, right? All right. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, that's the body, plus the breath of life equals living soul. So the dust minus the breath equals no living soul. Make sense? Right? Yes, very simple stuff here. Now, the majority of professed Christians, friends, believe that we have a separate soul that lives on after the body has died. Have you guys heard of that teaching? That you have a separate soul and when your body dies, your soul lives on after death. It, people believe that. I'm not saying it's true, right? Amen? Now, there's one big problem with this, my friends. It, that would make us immortal. And we saw that only God is immortal. So there's a problem with that belief. The Bible's very clear that only God, that includes the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that they have immortality. And we are only made immortal when? At the resurrection of Jesus Christ, when he comes back a second time. Let's read that text in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So there's no such thing as eternal life? I never said that. All right? What we're saying is the Bible does not say that you receive that when you die. The Bible does not say that you receive eternal life right when you die. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 to 54, all right? We are put in a slumber. Well, the Bible does call it a sleep, yes. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 to 54. So what do I believe happens when we die? I'm going to show you that this evening, but let's see what the Bible says, Okay? The Bible will give you the answer, my friends. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 to 54. All right? Let's find out the answer here. All right? Now, when will we receive immortality as a gift from God? Will we receive it when we die? The answer is no. Not according to the scriptures inspired by the Holy Spirit. Right? Let's read here. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all... What's that word right there? Uh, yes, I am recording this right now. 
What is this right here? We shall not all do what? Sleep, but we shall all be changed. That means not all of us will suffer death because we know there will be people alive at the second coming of Christ. So not all of us will sleep, but all of us in Christ will be changed. When will we be changed? Does it say when we die? No. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead, the dead, that's those that are sleeping, what's going to happen to them? They shall be raised, how? Incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Notice this does not take place at the second coming of Christ at all. Okay? Now look here. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. Now you tell me what we are right now. What's that word right there at the tip of the pen? What are you right now? What's that right there? What's that word? Mortal. We are mortal. And what will happen when the trumpet shall sound? We will put on what? Immortality. I just lost a follower from quoting the Bible. Well, I guess you, I guess you don't like the scriptures then. Am I not literally just quoting the Bible? <laughs> you can't even quote the Bible anymore, friends. People don't, people don't want to hear the Bible, right? So the Bible says that we are mortal and we will put on immortality at the last trumpet for the trumpet shall sound. When is that going to happen? Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. The same writer is Paul in both these books. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. When is that trumpet going to sound? Right here. Right? Friends, all we're doing is comparing Scripture with Scripture. That's all I'm showing you is the collection of scriptures paint the true picture here, right? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with what? The trumpet of God. There's that trumpet. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Didn't Paul just say that in 1 Corinthians 15? So when is that going to happen? When the Lord descends from heaven, not when you take your last breath. Then we which are alive and remain, those that have not gone to sleep. He says, we shall not all sleep. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So friends, if we go to, if, if, if the truth is, that we go to heaven when we die, which most people believe that are Christians, then why does it say here we will forever be with the Lord when he comes back a second time? If we're already with him when we die, aren't we ever with the Lord then? That makes no sense. It says when he comes down, he will receive us unto himself. Then we will be with him forever. All right. You see, believe the Bible as we bring these scriptures together. All right. Now, who's the one that told the first lie about death? Who's the one that told the first lie about death? Do you guys remember who that is? That's right, it's Satan. Satan told the lie. So let's go find out where he told that lie. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. Friends, I'm going to put forth to you tonight that most Christians are repeating the lie of the serpent. Okay? 
You guys know if you've been with me for some time, I do not sugarcoat things. I do have to tell you the truth from the scriptures. Amen. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. And let's look at verse 4. Actually, hold on one second. One second. Let's read first. Hold on one second. All right. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. And let's find out the origin of this false doctrine of the immortality of the soul. Amen? Let's go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. It says here, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, has God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So I want you to notice first, right off the bat, what is Satan doing with the word of God? He's twisting it. He's casting doubt on the word of God. Are there many in the body of Christ and even some in this live tonight that are casting doubts on the plain text that we've already read? Yes, the answer is yes. Instead of saying, Amen, Lord, I believe what you've written. They twist in their minds these scriptures to their own destruction saying, yeah, what about this? Or yeah, what about that? As if the Bible is fighting itself within the scriptures, which is not the case, right? So notice what he says. Has God really said this? You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, now this is what God said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. What is God saying? If you disobey me, you will die. But what is the serpent saying in verse 4? What did the serpent say? You shall not surely die. So you're not going to die. Don't worry about that. You're going to live on somewhere else. That's the saying today. See, in the garden, what he was saying is you can disobey God, but God won't really punish you. You won't really die. But today he's tweaked it a little bit. And he's saying, don't worry. You're not really going to die and go to sleep. You're going to go either to heaven or hell right when you die. And there's going to be the spirits of the dead etc., etc., right? So, the first lie about the state of the dead was Genesis 3, 4, the serpent. Now, this teaching of the immortality of the soul originated with Satan himself. It was the first lie, and it continues and is embraced by the whole world today. But let's take a quick look at what happened in the very beginning with Adam and Eve. Now, friends, how were Adam and Eve able to live forever? Do you guys know the answer to that question? How were Adam and Eve able to live forever? Genesis 3.22. You see there? So God allowed them to have access to the tree of life, but when they disobeyed, he cut off the access and they began to die. You see? Let's read Genesis 3.22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and do what? Live forever. So what is it that will enable us to live forever? We must have access to the tree of life. And you can only have access through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? So, 
We And where is the tree of life, friends? The tree of life, you don't get access when you die. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that, right? Now, can you see what's happening here in this story in Genesis? After Adam and Eve sinned, they could have continued to live forever by eating from the tree of life, but God denied them access to the tree of life, therefore denying them eternal life. Let me know if that makes sense, friends. All right? Let me know if this makes sense. He cut them off from eternal life when they were cut off from the tree. Very easy stuff. You see? Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims. That's, that's multiple angels and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep, keep the way of the tree of life. That word keep means to protect or guard so that they could not go back in and be immortal sinners. You see? So we cannot be immortal sinners. Make sense? All right. Now, what was God's promise in Genesis 3.19? And this is what we see all over the world today, even 6,000 years later. In the sweat of thy face, this is verse 19, shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt, re shalt thou return. Excuse me. You see? So we are returning to the dust. We do not receive eternal life. Adam and Eve did not receive eternal life when they went back to dust. Because they couldn't eat of the tree of life. We do not get access to the tree of life when we die. Right? Now, we already went through what a soul is. And we remember that man became a living soul. He did not receive a living soul. Now, the issue, friends, is so many Christians ignore this clear teaching in the Old Testament. So many ignore this. And yet these truths from the Old Testament have not changed. Friends, when we read things in the Old Testament... A lot of people tell me, you would be amazed how many times people tell me, uh, Brother Mike, that is in the Old Testament. It's different now. That's the Old Testament. As if these truths are changed somehow. But that is simply a doctrine of men. That's not a doctrine of the Bible. All right? From Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 22, all of it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness. Make sense? All right. Now, let's take a look at some things here. I'm going to go to probably the, in my opinion, the best set of texts, texts in the Bible talking about the state of the dead. Now, many of you will find this very familiar, but since we have new faces, we're going to go through it, of course, again. Let us go to Job, the book of Job, chapter 14. Let's go to the book of Job, chapter 14. We're going to start in verse 10, and we are going to read through verse 15. All right. Uh, Christ was did not descend into Sheol. You don't even know what Sheol is. Sheol is the grave. It's not a holding place where people are alive and he's down there doing things. Christ was dead in the grave. Very simple. All right? People making up things without any kind of scriptural basis is why there's a problem in Christianity today, friends. People are just saying things and making things up without any kind of biblical basis at all. That's the problem. Let's go to Job chapter 14, verse 10 through 15. All right. Now, friends, what we're going to do is we're going to be reading through these scriptures 
And we're going to be answering the questions with other scriptures. We're in Job chapter 14. We're going to start in verse 10. And we're going to read through verse 15. And you're going to be amazed how much truth is in these several verses. All right. Christ did not preach in hell. You're taking the words of Peter and you're not finishing the whole text that Peter said. Right. So that's incorrect. That is that is an error what you're saying. Right. Let's read in verse 10. But man dieth and wasteth away. Yea, man giveth up the ghost. And where is he? You see that? That's the question we're going to be answering, friends. Where is the man that dies and gives up his breath? The word ghost there means breath. Where is he? Let's answer that question very succinctly and very clearly. Verse 11. As the waters fail from the sea and the flood decays and dries up, man lieth down. We're going to take this very slowly. For those of you that want to know the truth, for those of you that not keep regurgitating lies in the chat, these texts are for you. Man lieth down and rises not. All right? How long will it be that they will be lying down and rising not? I'm using a KJV Bible, King James Bible. How long? Until the heavens be no more. They shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. Let me repeat that again. They shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. Till when? Till the heavens be no more. Now what I want you guys to do is I'm going to take you to different scriptures to answer these questions. When, when will the heavens be no more? So hold your place here and let us go to Revelation chapter 6. Hold your place in Job 14. When will the heavens be no more? Let us line up the scripture upon scripture, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. Revelation chapter 6. And I believe we're going to be going down to verse 14. Revelation verse, verse 14 in chapter 6. Excuse me. Revelation 6.14 gives you the answer. This is one of many texts. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. What event is this? What event is this? You guys let me know in the chat. When the heaven will depart as a scroll, as, as Job says, till the heavens be no more. Let me give you a little bit more info here. Look at verse 17. You see? For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? So what time is this at? When they will hide in the dens and the rocks of the mountains, saying to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of the Lamb. It's at the coming of Christ, is it not? Yes, it is. You see? So after the sixth seal and going into the seventh seal, which we know is when the coming of Christ takes place, what happens? The heavens will depart as a scroll when it is rolled together. Now, let me give you another witness. I'll give you another witness. Go to 2 Peter. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3. Let me find the verse for you. Go to 2 Peter chapter 3. Let me find the verse for you. 
We're going to go right over here. Verse 10. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. When will the heavens be no more? <laughs> 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. This is the answer to Job's question. We saw in Revelation 6, 14 that it would be at the coming of Christ. How about now? But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. This is also talking about the coming of Christ. Watch this. In which the heavens will do what? Shall pass away with a great noise. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So when will the heavens pass away? Like Job says, when the Lord comes as a thief in the night. So this is at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Make sense? Right? Are you guys connecting these dots with me? Please let me know in the chat. This is 2 Peter 3.10. Amen? So Job told us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, right? Job is telling us that we will not rise until the second coming of Christ. 2 Peter 3.10. Yes. And, and I am recording this, and I'll be adding it to YouTube most likely tomorrow. So you can get the texts again. Amen? So let's go back to Job. Amen? Amen. Let's go back to the book of Job, chapter 14 again. So let's plug this back in. So man lieth down and riseth not till when? Till the heavens be no more. Until the second coming of Jesus Christ, they shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. See? Now let's move on to verse 13. And I'm going to show you this way of studying the Bible in every one of these verses. All right? Now notice what he says here in verse 13. Oh, that you would hide me. Where is he going to be hidden? Oh, that you would hide me where? Where, 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 is, where is Job going to be hidden? Is he going to be hidden in heaven with Christ? In the grave. Oh, that you would hide me in the grave that you would keep me secret until when? Here we go again, right? How long would Job be hidden in the grave? Until thy wrath be passed. <laughs> that thou wouldest appoint me a set time and remember me. Now, I'm going to show you the wrath of God. I'm going to show you right now. So when this passes, what I'm about to show you, he says that then he would come out of the grave. Okay? So we want to look for God's wrath, and when it is passed, Job would come out of the grave. All right? Let's go to Revelation. Let's go back to Revelation. Hold your spot here again. Let's go to Revelation chapter 15. And we're going to go to verse 1. Revelation 15 verse 1. If they're cremated, it doesn't matter because God, is, God has a new body made in the heavens for us. He's not using our old body. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, there's a body that God already has made for us in heaven. So we will, he, will, he doesn't need this old body, so it doesn't matter if it's buried or if it's cremated. Right? Amen? Now look what it says here. Revelation 15, 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up what? 
What's that say right there? What is the wrath of God? What is the wrath of God? Seven last plagues. You see? The seven last plagues are the wrath of God. You see? I'm going to show you the same thing in the next chapter, Revelation 16, verse 1. I'm going to show you another witness right here. Revelation 16, verse 1. We're looking at the wrath of God because Job says in Job 14, 13, that he would be hidden in the grave, that we, you and I, would be hidden in the grave until God's wrath is passed. Okay? And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, go your ways and pour out the vials of what? The wrath of God upon the earth. So what are the vials? We read that in chapter 15. That's the seven last plagues. And we can see that here with the different plagues, right? So what is the wrath of God? The seven last plagues, right? So let us go back to Job chapter 14. And yes, friends, we are going to get to the thief on the cross. But in order to understand that story, you must know what the Bible says about the state of the dead. If you don't know what the Bible says about death, you will misunderstand the story of the thief on the cross. Okay? That's why we're establishing a foundation first. Right? So let's go back here to Job chapter 14. Right? Let's go back to verse 13. Now we saw in verse 12 that man would lie down and rise not until the second coming of Jesus Christ. The heavens be no more. What about this one? Oh, that thou wouldest hide me in the grave, that thou wouldest keep me secret until when? Until the seven last plagues be passed. Friends, in the Bible, who comes after the seven last plagues? You guys let me know in the chat. Who comes after the seven last plagues? You guys don't know who that is? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ comes at the end of the seven last plagues. Right? So, who's going to be bringing him out of the grave? Jesus Christ. That you would appoint me a set time and remember me. You see? So he's saying that he would be hidden in the grave until the seven last plagues are passed. What would be happening after that? The second coming of Christ and the first resurrection of the dead. Same here. When the heavens be no more, that's at the second coming of Christ and the first resurrection of the dead. You see? All we're doing is connecting the dots together. But there's more. There's more. Right? In verse 14, in verse 14, if a man dies, shall he live again? He's going to answer that question. All the days of my appointed time, look what he says, appointed time, appointed time. I will wait. I will wait. How long will Job wait? Until, notice he always says the same thing. Up here, he says until. Over here, he says until. Now he says until again. Until when? My change comes. Friends, didn't we just read at the beginning of this study tonight something about us being changed? Do you guys remember that? Amen? Do you guys remember we just read about someone being changed in the twinkling of an eye? At the last trumpet? Yes. Yes, we did. So what change is he talking about? He's saying that he will wait until when? The last 
trumpet, which we know is at the second coming of Jesus Christ and the first resurrection of the dead. <laughs> Friends, all three of these texts, number 12, number 13, number 14, they all say the same thing, pointing to the same event. You see? It's not when we die. It's when Christ comes that we receive immortality. Right now, the Bible says we receive the promise and he gives us the Holy Spirit as a down payment. But we have not received eternal life yet, according to the scriptures. A promise and a down payment, but we have not received the full reward and we don't receive it when we die, according to the Bible. Uh, no, he is not conscious. He is not. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you in the Bible that we are not conscious. I'll show you that right now. What about verse 15? So we're reading down to verse 15, right? Thou shall call, and I will answer thee. You have a desire to the work of your hands. Where can we find in the Bible where God will call and the and Job will answer. Now, excuse me, one of those places is where we already read in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, where the, the Lord will descend with a shout and the dead in Christ will rise, right? So we know from 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, which we won't go there because we already went there, that God does shout, Christ shouts, and the dead in Christ rise. But is there another scripture that's a little bit more plain? than that. Thou shalt call and I will answer. So when is that going to take place? Let's go to John chapter 5. John chapter 5, 28 and 29. Friends, I pray for you guys tonight. I pray for you that you're receiving the understanding from the scriptures. And I pray that God will continue to guide you in his truth. Amen. Let's go to John chapter 5. And let's go to 28 and 29. This is the words of Jesus Christ himself. Remember, Job said that God would call and Job would answer from the grave. Remember? Job said that he would be hidden in the grave, but when God calls him, he would answer. Look at John chapter 5. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves... Uh-oh, let's take a look. The hour is coming in which all that are in the graves, isn't that where Job said he would be? Shall hear his voice. Job says that he would be hidden in the grave and that God would call him. You see? And shall come forth they that have done good to the resurrection of life, they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. So do you guys see here? From the grave, those that are in the grave will hear his voice, him calling, and they will answer. Amen? Right from the words of our Savior himself. All right? This is John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. So Christ is saying, just as Job said, that all of those in the grave, everybody that dies goes into the grave, right? And if you die in Christ, you will hear his voice at the first resurrection and the dead in Christ will rise first. If you die outside of Christ, you will hear his voice when? At the resurrection of damnation and you will come forth to receive your judgment. You're not judged when you die. All right? In the sense of receiving your judgment. You don't go straight to hell. You go into the grave, and then he resurrects you to damnation, and you're cast in the lake of fire. 
That's Revelation 20. So nobody's going to hell. They're in the grave. And if they've done evil, they will rise in the second resurrection. Very simple. No one's burning in hell. No one's in heaven, except for the select few that are mentioned in the Bible. Outside of those people, everybody else is in the grave. Right? That's correct. Nobody's in hell right now, according to the Bible. Let's take a look here. Let's take a look at some other scriptures here. Let's go to the book of Psalms. And we will be getting to the thief on the cross. Don't worry. Excuse me. Let's go to Psalm 115, verse 7. Excuse me. Psalm 115, verse 17. I'm sorry. Let's go to Psalm 115, verse 17. Uh, that's correct. We, we, well, right now we would cease to exist but we are either dead in Christ or outside of Christ. So when you go into the grave, you're either in Christ or not, and you'll be raised in one of two resurrections. Where in the Bible does it say no one's in hell? Uh, pretty much every scripture we've been looking at. Let's take a look at Psalm 115, verse 17. Look what it says here. Friends, what does it say about those that are dead? Do they praise God? Do they praise God? The dead praise not the Lord. Notice it doesn't say if they're saved or lost. It just says the dead. That means everybody's going to one place. The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down where? Into silence. Into silence. Why is it silent? Because they're in the grave. Make sense? Right? The dead know nothing. Let's take a look here at, let's try Psalm 6-5. We're going to see if that has anything for us. Yes, let's go to Psalm 6-5. Amen? I'm using the King James Version of the Bible. Amen? Now remember, friends, this is not an interpretation I'm giving you tonight. I'm not giving you my interpretation. All right? So there's some people that are saying, you know, this is your interpretation, whether you agree or not, that's fine. This, I'm literally just showing you the texts. That's all I'm doing is pointing you to the text. That's it, right? Look what it says here. Psalm 6, 5. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In the grave, who shall give you thanks? I didn't write that, <laughs> right? Now look at this little statement right here. This is interesting. Popular theology represents the righteous dead in heaven, entered into bliss and praising God with immortal tongue. But Hezekiah could see no much such glorious prospect in death. With his words agree the testimony of the psalmist, In death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave who shall give thee thanks? And the dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence, which is what we just read before. You see? So, what happens when there's, we die? We go to the grave, and what we will be doing? Nothing, right? Let's go to Psalm 30, verse 9. We'll go to Psalm 30, verse 9. Very interesting. 
This is an interesting text here. <clears throat> what profit is there in my blood when I go down where? To the pit. What is that word pit right there? That's the same word as the word grave. Uh, so Jesus was lying. That's what you're trying to say. No, Jesus was not lying. The problem is with the punctuation and we'll get to that text. All right. Jesus did not say today you'll be with me in paradise. He said, truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. I'm telling you this right now. You will be with me in paradise. He did not tell him that that day, because the Bible says that he did not go, neither did the thief go. So the issue is with the punctuation, but we'll get into that. All right. Psalm 30, verse 9. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit, the grave? Shall the dust praise you? Shall the dust declare your truth? Of course not. So where are we going? Down to the pit, down to the grave. What shall we be? Shall we be? We're going to be dust and we're not going to be praising the Lord because we're dead. Let's go to Psalm, I believe it's 88. Let me find the verse for you. Let's see. Not sure about that. Let me find the other verse where we were at. And then we will go from there. Okay. Let's go to... Let's go to Ecclesiastes. Amen. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Oops, I went way too far there. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. And we're going to look at verses 5, 6, and 10. Uh, yes, I specifically said, if you were here when I said it, I said, no one's in heaven except those that are specifically named in the Bible. Let me repeat that. No one is in heaven except those that are specifically named. I said that about five minutes ago. Right? So, of course, Moses is, Enoch is, Elijah is, but your best friend, your mother, your parents, your spouse, anybody that you know today that has passed away in Christ, they're not in heaven. They're in the grave, waiting the second coming of Christ. Right? Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5, 6, and 10. Now, someone asked me earlier, uh, was Job conscious in the grave? Here's your answer. Here's your answer. Right? Let's look at verse 5. Now, friends, look how plain and clear this is for you. Amen? For the living know that they shall die. But the dead don't know anything. All right. The dead not know not anything, neither have they any more a reward. For the memory of them is forgotten. Their love, those that are dead, they don't have any more love, hatred, or envy. All of that is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Right. Now, let me ask you guys a question for those of you that are quoting to be absent from the body present with the Lord. Let me ask you guys a question. Does that statement that you're quoting line up with the rest of the Bible here? When someone says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Does that line up with these other texts that we're reading? Yes or no? It does, does not, does it? You want to know why it doesn't, friends? Because they're not quoting it correctly. That's why. 
They're quoting one verse and they're not quoting the whole verse. Paul never said to be absent is to be. He never says that. You guys are saying that, whoever's quoting it that way. He never says that. He says, I would rather be absent and then be present with the Lord. And since Paul wrote 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, what did he say about when we would be with the Lord? At the second coming of Jesus Christ, not when we die. So you guys that are taking it out of context, you need to stop doing that. All right? Let's read verse 10. Let's read verse 10. Whatsoever thy hand finds to do, do it with thy might. Why should we do that, Solomon? For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave where you go. You see? So there's no work, no plans, no knowledge, no wisdom in the grave where you're going. Over here, let's repeat it again. You have, you don't know anything. You have no memory. You have no emotions. How clear is this? Are the saints that are going to be with the Lord at the second coming? Uh, the saints that are coming with him are not, they're not people. Over and over, Jesus says there's only one group coming with him, the angels. The angels are coming with Christ to gather the harvest. There's no people coming down, no spirits or souls coming with him down to the earth. That's not what the Bible says, right? What about when we dream about our loved ones? Uh, it's simply a dream. That's it. God is not going to give you a dream that contradicts the scriptures, right? Right? <clears throat> so so in, in Luke chapter 16, that is a parable, a parable, all right? Now, let me make a strong point for you guys, all right? Let me flip this around so I can make a little point with you guys here, all right? All right, let me make something very clear for you, my friends. First of all, I want to thank you guys for joining and interacting in the chat. As we've been covering this Bible study, we still have a bit more to cover. Scriptures do not contradict scriptures. Let me repeat that again. Scriptures do not contradict scriptures. So, all the texts that we've been reading that paint a very clear picture about death. How can you then go to the story of the rich man and Lazarus and say, yeah, but... You see, you have to interpret those things with other scriptures. Does that make sense? So if you read the story of the rich man and Lazarus, right? If you read that, it, the story is not a story about the state of the dead at all. Christ was using this story to show that the Pharisees, though they claimed Abraham as their father, they were lost. And the beggar that was looking for the bread, which is the word of God, the rich man, the Pharisees, would not give to them. You see? And so when they thought they were saved, they were really lost and vice versa. He was not teaching you that hell is burning right now. He was using a story to illustrate something else. And everybody keeps saying, oh, look at this, look at this. Friends, if you take the story of Lazarus and the rich man, literally, you have some major problems, right? Here's the most glaring problem that you cannot answer from the Bible. You'll never be able to answer it. Where does the beggar Lazarus go? Uh, I, st I do these Bible studies Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. 
Where in the story of Lazarus and the rich man, where did Lazarus go? According to, the, to that text. And no, he did not go to paradise. It does not say that in that text. It says he went to Abraham's bosom. Nobody's even said that yet. One person said it. It says in Luke 16 that Lazarus the beggar went to Abraham's bosom. Here's my question. Where do you find what Abraham's bosom means in the Bible? Did you know that that phrase only exists one time in that chapter? So there's nowhere in the Bible to tell you what that means. So you know what people do? They read it and they start guessing. Abraham's bosom is not a physical place. It's not a place where someone goes. It's simply something, a symbol that Jesus used for something. But people are taking it literally when there's nowhere in the Bible that tells you what Abraham's bosom is. Nowhere. We need to stop guessing, friends. You're guessing. And then you're establishing those guesses as truth. That doesn't make any sense. You need to allow the Bible to interpret the Bible. All right? Now, we will get in a few minutes to paradise. All right? Dealing with the thief on the cross. And I'm going to show you very clearly they didn't go to paradise. Christ didn't go. And definitely that thief did not go. Right? And we're going to cover why he would say, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. It's because there was a grammatical error with the comma in that text. Right? Amen? So let's go here. Let's go to the story. The story is real. If it were to be a parable, they wouldn't be using names. Can you show me that God says that in the Bible? You're just making that up. Right? So what we do is we make things up and we apply it to the Bible. So what this individual says and what so many other Christians say is, oh, well, Jesus, if he uses a name in a parable, then it's not a parable anymore. Can you show me where God says that that's the principle he uses? Where does he ever say that? Only you're saying that. Simple as that. Because he used a person's name, all of a sudden, now it's, now it's real. You're telling me that Christ can't use a person and put him into a story? Why are you putting him in a box? Which is what you're doing. Right? Right? Well, how do we know when it's to be literal or something else? By comparing scripture upon scripture. How do I know Luke 16, the story of Lazarus and the rich man? How do I know that's a story and not literal? Because we are comparing scripture with scripture. The Bible says that all go to the grave and they have no knowledge. So how can you read these texts that we've been reading and you're going to turn around and say, yeah, but he went to Abraham's bosom and he went down into the flames of hell. Well, clearly that's not real because it contradicts what the Bible says. It's not a real story. It's not literal. Very easy, right? This is what you guys need to understand. You're not comparing scripture with scripture. You're reading a text and you're making an assumption and creating your own doctrines. And then when these other scriptures, like we've been covering tonight, whenever they're presented to you, you say, that's a lie. That's a false teaching. Let's get back to the Bible. Let me zoom in for you. Go. Oh, I'm a little bit too low there. There we go. Zoom back in for you guys. It always zooms out first. All right. Let's take a look at some more things here. All right. Let's go into the story of the thief on the cross. Let's go into the story of the thief on the cross. Now, as we go into the story, I want you to remember everything we've covered so far. We are not immortal. Let me repeat that again. 
This is what we've covered so far. You and I are mortal. We are subject to death. We are not immortal. We discovered that we receive immortality at the second coming of Christ. So how can, in that story, how can the rich man go straight into hell and Lazarus the beggar go straight into Abraham's bosom? Doesn't make any sense, right? Let's go to Luke chapter 23. And it's a very short story, but so many people want to use it and say this is the ultimate truth about the state of the dead. Let's look at Luke chapter 23, verse 40. Uh, we'll start in verse 39. We're in, we're in last, uh, excuse me, <laughs> well, that's a mess up. Luke 23, verse 39. Let's take a look at this. Look how short this story is, friends, but so many people cling to this as if it's the only truth. Uh, is everything okay now? Some of you saying it was glitching. Is everything okay again? You guys let me know in the chat. All right, good. Let's start in verse 39. Here is the story of the thief on the cross. Now, friends, when I posted my little video advertising tonight, I had several people and I even had some people DM me and they said that I didn't know where paradise was and they were saying paradise is this, paradise is that. Friends, I'm going to show you from the Bible where paradise is. Okay? I'm going to show you from the Bible. Let's start in verse 39. And one of the malefactors, one of the evildoers, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? We are in Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23, starting in verse 39 talking about the thief on the cross. Now look at what the one thief is basically mocking and the others rebuking him. Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when... when all right, here we go. Look. When thou comest into thy kingdom. And what was his response? Everybody's hanging everything on this one verse. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Now, guys, I want you to read this little, little box right here that actually explains what's wrong here. All right. Now you guys let me know in the original Greek was there any punctuation? In the original Greek that now remember the words are inspired. The words are inspired, but the commas, the periods, etc were added by translators, okay? No. There was none. I say unto thee today, look what it says. Here's the difference. I say unto thee today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Christ did not promise that the thief should be with him in paradise that day. He himself did not go that day to paradise. He slept in the tomb and on the morning of the resurrection, he said, I am not yet ascended to my father, John 20, 17. Today, while dying upon the cross as a malefactor, Christ assures the poor sinner, thou shalt be with me in paradise. So, what happens when we move this period right here? When we move the, uh, not the period, the comma, excuse me, the comma. How does it read then? 
And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee today, Shalt thou be with me in paradise? You see? Now, that lines up with everything else we've read. He said, I'm telling you today, you will be with me in paradise, right? Someday, not that same day. Now, it was referenced right here in John chapter 20. And then I'm going to show you where this is. I'm going to show you where this is. And after you know where this is, you will know that the thief did not go that day. Okay, I'm going to show you. All right. Watch this. Let's go to John chapter 20, verse 17. All right. Remember, he said, if you believe this version of it, that, that Christ would go to paradise that same day, right? Let's go to John chapter 20. John chapter 20, we're going to read verse 16 and 17. Yeah, it might, be, it might be glitching because I'm turning the pages so close to the camera. <clears throat> Look what this says here. Amen. It says here, Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. Okay? That's very important. Now, here's where we're going to start digging into a little bit of the deeper part of the subject here. All right? Now, where is the Father? He said he had not yet ascended to my Father. Now, People are telling me in the comments, in the DMs, that paradise and heaven are not the same thing. Okay? Uh, he did not go to paradise. I'm going to show you that paradise is not what you think it is. Okay? Paradise is not what you think it is. All right? Now, where is the father at? He's obviously still, he's in heaven, correct? Would you guys agree with me that the Father resides in what we understand to be heaven? Is that correct? Okay. So Christ is saying here, touch me not for I am not yet ascended into heaven. But some of you might be saying, yeah, but that's not the same thing as paradise, right? How many of you would be saying that? All right. Well, let me show you something. All right. Would you guys like to know where paradise is? Yes. If you would like a link to this Bible, you can send me a direct message and I'll send you the link. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and we are going to start in verse 1, 1 through 4. I'm going to give you a little hint here, and it's going to become clear in the next two verses after this. Paradise is on this earth after the devil is jailed for a thousand years. Uh, maybe. Let me show you. Let's let the Bible tell us the answer. We don't need to guess. Paradise is not under the ground. Paradise is not a holding place for souls or anything like that. All right? It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knows... Such an one was caught up where? We, we're going to break this down. So he knew a man that was caught up where? In vision. 
Okay? You guys let me know. The third heaven. Now watch this. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knows, how that he was caught up to where? What is that word there? So where is paradise? He's speaking about the same thing. You see that? So what? It, where is paradise, friends? It's in the third heaven. It's not in some holding place somewhere in the earth. It's not in an ethereal realm somewhere where souls are sitting there waiting for Christ. No. And I'm going to show you even more. I've got two more texts to show you to prove you even more. All right. So he's speaking about the same vision here. He's saying a man, and I believe, I believe he was speaking about himself in the third person, but he says this man was caught up in vision to the third heaven. Now he turns around and says he was caught up into paradise. Right? Uh, why was Jesus preaching about hell? He did not preach about hell. All right? I'll show you that text too. We'll get to that after this. All right? So what is Paul saying here? Paul is saying that paradise is where? The third heaven. All right? But I'm going to prove that to you even more. Because this you could count as maybe semi-vague if you really wanted to. Let me prove it to you a little bit more. All right? I want to take you to Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. Go to Revelation chapter 2. Now, what's in paradise that will reveal the location? I'm proving where paradise is regarding the thief on the cross. Revelation 2.7. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of what? The tree of life which is in the midst of where? So where is the tr Where is paradise, friends? We just read in 2 Corinthians 12, it's the third heaven. Now we read that paradise is where the tree of life is. The tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Okay? Now, I'm going to show you even more. All right. Third heaven, amen. So, what are we seeing here so far? Where do you think paradise is now? And I've got one more scripture to show you. Where is paradise? Uh, yes, this live will be uploaded. The third heaven is here on earth? Uh, no, it's not. Not yet. So paradise is in the third heaven. Paradise is where the tree of life is. Let me show you one more text. Now, in order to better connect paradise, let's look at the tree of life. Okay? Let's look at the tree of life. Because if the tree of life is in paradise, let's find more information about the tree of life and that will give us a definitive position of the paradise. Make sense? Let's go to Revelation 22. Uh, actually, it might be Revelation... Hold on. Revelation 22 two. Let's actually start in Revelation 22, 1. So the tree of life is in the paradise of God. And that's the paradise Christ was talking about. Paul said the paradise was the third heaven. So we, we know it's where the father is. Let's read Revelation 22, 1 and 2. Look how clear, clear this is. Where's the tree of life, right? 
And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Where's it at, friends? In the midst of the street. What street? The New Jerusalem. And on either side of the river was there the tree of life. So where's the tree of life? In the city. Make sense? In the midst of the street, where was the tree of life? We're connecting dots. But right now, where is it now? Where's the new Jerusalem? Where's it at? Where's the new Jerusalem right now, friends? It's not on earth. The new Jerusalem is in heaven, where the Father is, because it says that his throne is inside the city. So it calls it the paradise of God because God's there. It says the tree of life is in the paradise, and Paul says the paradise is in the third heaven. So based on these scriptures and all the scriptures we looked at tonight, did Christ or the thief, go to paradise that same day? Yes or no? According to what we're learning about the state of the dead and about these scriptures about where paradise is, Jesus said he had not yet ascended to the Father. That's where paradise is. So how did he go that same day? He didn't. And the thief didn't go because... The Bible says the dead don't know anything. Okay? Right? So, let's go back to the text of the thief on the cross. I showed you from the Bible that paradise is where God is in the New Jerusalem, the third heaven. Let's go back to Luke chapter 23 and read that one more time. He did not go to hell. You guys need to, you guys are, uh, is it still glitching? Now, when it, when you say it's glitching, what is it doing? Because I'm not seeing anything on my screen. He had things to do before he could ascend. That's incorrect. <clears throat> oh, it just cuts off? Okay. I think it has to do when I'm turning pages. It always does it when I'm turning pages. All right. So notice what he says here. What is he really saying about paradise? Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me where? In the new Jerusalem. In the presence of the Father. Is that true? No, it's not. Because it didn't happen that day, did it? Uh, where, <laughs> sometimes you guys ask me questions that don't make any sense. I never said anything about Christ not sitting on the throne. <laughs> I don't know why you're asking me that. Right? So it's very easy to understand when this comma is moved right here, verily I say unto you today, Shalt thou be with me in paradise? All right? Very simple. All right. Doesn't Peter say Jesus went to hell to preach for those three days? No. No, he did not. Right? So let's find out about that. We're going to go into 2 Peter. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 2. For all of you that are saying he went down to hell preaching... You guys are not quoting it correctly. You guys are not quoting it correctly. You're misquoting it. You're not continuing the verse. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 2. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 2, and we'll put that to bed because you guys are, you guys are misquoting it pretty badly. Second Peter chapter 2.
We're going to start in verse 4. Uh, hold on. No, it's not verse 4. Excuse me. Hold on one second. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm in the wrong book. I'm in the wrong book. I'm sorry. It's 1 Peter chapter 3. I'm sorry, Stormy. My mistake. 1 Peter chapter 3. Excuse me on that. I went to the wrong text. 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 18. Yes, it, sa it says he descended into the lower part of the earth. He went into the grave. Very simple, right? He did not descend down into a chamber of hell preaching to people. Let's go to 1 Peter 3.18. I'm going to show you. I'm using the King James Version of the Bible. How long are my studies? On average, they're two hours. Now, let's start in verse 18. 1 Peter 3.18. I'm going to show you guys that you're incorrect when you're preaching when you're misquoting this text, okay? Now watch this. Starting in verse 18, let's go very slow, okay? I pray you guys are following along. 1 Peter 3, 18, watch this. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. That was on the cross where he took our sins that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Holy Spirit. Now, let's go really slow so you guys can understand. All right? I cannot move commas. Uh, well, I'll, le I'll leave that alone for the sake of time, but you, you can have your opinion. But we've already proven that that's an incorrect spot. Now, notice what it says. When it says by which, what is it talking about? Quickened means made alive. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Holy Spirit. What does this mean right here? By which? By which what? By the Holy Spirit. Okay? Follow me here, friends. If you want to know the truth about this. By the Holy Spirit, also he... Who's he? Jesus Christ. By the Spirit, Christ went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Now, that's where everybody stops. They don't continue reading. Someone said in hell, that's a lie. You're, you're speaking falsehoods. You need to read verse 20. It doesn't say hell anywhere. Where were the spirits at? When did this take place? The spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when? In hell? In the days of Noah, not in hell. When once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Where, where do you see hell in there anywhere? That There's no hell in there. All that simply is saying is that when Noah was preaching, look at this, friends, very easy stuff here. God was long-suffering in the days of Noah, right? He was patient. He gave those people 120 years while the ark was preparing. During that time, how was Christ through the Holy Spirit speaking? Through Noah. Make sense? So who were the spirits in prison? Oh. Who were the spirits in prison? Uh, friends, have you ever heard of the phrase in the Bible that you are in the prison or bondage of sin? The prison of sin? Have you ever heard of that before?
Okay. Isaiah 42, 7. I'm going to show you. Hold your place here. Okay. Hold your place in 1 Peter. Isaiah 42, verse 7. I'm going to give you a prophecy of the Messiah. What are the spirits in prison? Were they literally in prison in the ground? No, not at all. They were in a prison of a different kind. Isaiah 42, verse 7. Look what it says here. A promise of Christ. Okay? I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand and will keep you and give you for a covenant of the people for a light to the Gentiles to open the blind eyes to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. You see? So what were the spirits in prison, friends? They were people that were blind sitting in darkness during the days of Noah. And Noah, through the Holy Spirit, was preaching to those people. That's all it's talking about. Right? So the Holy Spirit, Christ, through the Holy Spirit, was preaching to who? Those people that were in prison, bondage during that time. It doesn't say that they were in hell. Nowhere does it say they were in hell, okay? Let's see here. Let's go to Isaiah 61, verse 1. I'm going to show you another one. Isaiah 61, verse 1. The work of Christ. Right? I'm showing you what the prison is, friends, using the Bible. So remember, the context we were reading was Christ dying, and he was made alive through the Holy Spirit. And it says then, by which the Holy Spirit, Christ preached to the prisoners, the spirits in prison, rather. Who were those people in prison? That he was speaking through, the, look what it says right here. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, Christ. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. You see? So they're bound in what, friends? They're bound in sin. That's the prison. Make sense? Is this, is this becoming clear to you guys? It has nothing to do with Christ going and preaching to people in hell. Because it says it was during the days of Noah where he preached through the Holy Spirit to people in prison. But it never says they were in hell because Christ gets who out of prison? Those that are bound. And we read those that are walking in darkness. Amen? So let's go back to our text. I could probably find another one. See if I can find another one. Now I gave you two witnesses. Let's keep going. <laughs> Amen? Let's go back to our, to our statement in, in the book of Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3. Let's read this one more time. Amen? Remember, we're using the Bible to interpret these things, friends. We don't want to use our own understanding. Notice the whole context is Christ through the Holy Spirit. Right? The, the whole context is Christ through the Holy Spirit, where Christ through the Holy Spirit went and preached unto the spirits in prison. When did this happen? When Christ died? No. Those spirits in prison were disobedient 
when once the patience of God waited in the days of Noah. Very simple. So when you read the story of Noah before the flood, Noah was preaching. Who was inspiring Noah to preach righteousness? It was the Holy Spirit, Christ through the Holy Spirit. And so who was he preaching to? Those that were bound in sin, those that were walking in darkness, he was preaching them that a flood was coming. They needed to get on the ark. Make sense? I pray this is understanding in your ears, my friends. Right? I pray this is understanding in your ears. So let us not look at some of these texts because people, what they do is they read 19 and they stop. They never read verse 20. They never find out what this prison is. People, we need, every time you come across something in the Bible that you're like, I wonder what that is. What, what, what was that prison? Let me, let me go search it out really quick. Or don't stop at one verse, continue, because it tells you it wasn't when Christ was crucified and went into the grave. It was during the days of Noah. <laughs> right? So, let's take a quick look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For those of you that are quoting, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Let's find out what that really says. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is where we're going to find that text. And we're going to start in verse 8 and then we're going to interpret it with the Bible. How did I find all these answers? Uh, well, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be honest, friends. A lot of studying in the Bible. A lot of studying. I also have, uh, I have my laptop here that helps me search words. But I also, the Lord has given me uh, the gift of remembrance, essentially. I can remember numbers and verses and stuff pretty quickly. Thank the Lord for that. So most of the stuff comes to my mind. But if there's other particular things, then I have things on my laptop where I can do word searches and I can show you guys. Amen. So let's take a look at this text now. In verse eight. Does Paul say, be honest with me. Second Corinthians five, eight. Does Paul say for a fact that right when we're absent from the body, that we will be immediately present with the Lord. I, I upload to YouTube, so you can find the YouTube button on my profile on TikTok. I'll probably be uploading this tomorrow. Notice what he says. He does not say for a fact that this happens, but everybody keeps quoting it because when they quote this, they quote, to be absent is to be present, but he never says that. Look what he says. We are confident, I say, and willing, rather, I would rather be absent from this body and be present with the Lord. Does he say that happens right when you die? Can you guys find me that in this text? Where does he say that you immediately go to be with the Lord? He doesn't even say that. You know how many people quote this text saying he says that? Because they don't look at this one word right here. Right? They don't. Now, in the other writings of Paul, such as 1 Corinthians 15 that we read, or 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, when does Paul say that we will be present with the Lord? You guys let me know in the chat. Paul wrote this. What did Paul say? When did Paul say we would be present with the Lord in his other writings? At the second coming. Yes, in the second coming. 1 Corinthians 15. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. Right? We will receive immortality. 1 Thessalonians 4.16. The Lord will descend from heaven with a shout. We will, we, will, we will ever be with the Lord. So when will we be present with the Lord and absent from the body we're in right now? 
what body is this talking about? Is this the old body or the new body? You guys let me know in the chat. What body would he rather be absent from, the old or the new? What do you guys think? He's talking about the old body. So he says, I would rather be absent from this old body and be present with the Lord, but you'll only be present with the Lord when you have the new body at the second coming of Christ. Make sense? (laughs) It's very simple. Are you saying we do not go to heaven upon death? I'm saying that the Bible does not teach that. The Bible does not teach that we go straight to heaven when we die. Now, let me show you guys. We're going to read this chapter here. Did you guys know that verse 8 comes after the seven verses here? And everyone that quotes verse 8 never talks about these seven verses. Right? Let's read the seven verses. And then when we read verse 8, you'll understand. Okay? That makes sense? 2 Corinthians 5, 1. Don't ever start down here. Always go back up first. All right? For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. Let's stop right there. What is this earthly house he's talking about? What is this earthly house? You guys let me know in the chat. We're going to break all of this down so by the time you get to eight, you won't be mistaken. What is the earthly house? Our old body, what, what we're in right now, right? For we know that if our old body were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house, Eternal in the heavens, not made with hands. What house is that? So if this is the old body and this is a house not made with hands, what house is that? It's the new body, right? So this chapter right here is talking about the old body versus the new body, right? Now, we know the house is not a a literal house because it says we'll be clothed with the house. You see? Watch this. For in this, in the old body, we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our house, which is from heaven. So in this, our old body, we are groaning, desiring to be clothed with the new body, which is from heaven. You see? Very easy to understand. Let's go to verse three. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. Let's stop right there. What does it mean to be naked? If you're in this body right now and you're clothed with the old body, and if clothing with the new body means you're wearing something, what does it mean if you're naked? (laughs) It means you're dead. You're not clothed with anything. You're naked. You're not clothed with anybody at all. Does that make sense? So you're between the old body and the new body. And the Bible says you're in the grave. Make sense? So he says, if so being that clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this old body do groan being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed. So we don't desire to be naked. We don't desire to be dead, friends. We don't want to die. But rather, we would rather be clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. What is he saying here? We don't desire to be unclothed, but we desire to have the new body so that we would be immortal. Make sense? Ah, Brother Dwayne. Good to see you, brother. (laughs) Put on Christ means to be clothed. Well, in this context, being clothed means you're wearing a body, right? Is this making sense so far, friends? Is this making sense? 
You're okay, sister, no problem. We're, we're breaking down verse by verse. I pray this makes sense. He's talking about the old versus the new body. That's it, right? Amen. Let's read verse five. The body is our garment, amen. Now he that has worked us for the self same thing as God. So who's doing the work? God is doing the work. Who also has given unto us the earnest or down payment of the spirit. I was telling you guys that earlier. The down payment of your new body is the Holy Spirit. The down payment of immortality of life is the Holy Spirit. You see the earnest or the down payment. Okay. Therefore, we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in our old body, we are absent from the Lord. Make sense? Because you cannot stand in the Lord's presence in the old body. So while we are at home in our current bodies, we cannot stand in the presence of the Lord. Make sense? Easy to understand. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Now read verse 8. You see, you have to read all this first. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from this old body. Friends, if we're absent from this old body, what will we be clothed with? The new body. And to be present with the Lord. You see? Why did you delete my comment, you false prophet? Uh, well, Jeremy, you shouldn't jump to conclusions. I didn't delete your comment. It was probably TikTok. By the way, TikTok filters comments. So I don't appreciate statements like false prophet when I didn't do anything. That's not a very good spirit you have. All right. So notice what it says here, friends. So we would, ra friends, do you agree with Paul? Do you agree with Paul? Would you rather be absent from this old body and to be clothed with the new body in the presence of the Lord? Yes, amen to that. But the, again, that does not happen when we die. You see? Let's go back one more time before we close to better understand this. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. All right? So what does it mean to be absent from this body and present with the Lord? So many people confuse that. Go, go back with me to 1 Corinthians 15, 51. We're going to read this again. Where was Moses in the Mount of Transfiguration? His new body was not given. Moses was already resurrected, according to the book of Jude. He already had a new body. All right, he was already he was already in heaven. What these texts are talking about are for those that are not yet there. This is not talking about Moses. It talks about those that will be on the earth at the second coming of Christ, not Moses, Enoch, Elijah, etc. We're not talking about them, right? Amen. So with what we just read in 2 Corinthians 5, which was written by Paul, is also here in 1 Corinthians 15, written by Paul. So we need to read all of Paul's writings if you want to understand what Paul is saying. I would, I would, I would rather be absent from this body and present with the Lord. When does that happen? Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed with the new body, you see? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, when we die, no, 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 at the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. So we will be absent from our old body and will be changed and will be present with the Lord. All right? For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal will put on, that means you're going to be clothed with immortality. Amen. Verse 54. 
So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and when this mortal shall have put on immortality, then, not when you die, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Friends, that does not take place when you die. It takes place when you receive your new body. Then you will be absent from this old body and present with the Lord when the Lord comes in the clouds and he raises the dead to life. Does this make sense? From everything else we read, the dead don't know anything. Only God has immortality. He gives it as a gift. Let me bring you guys back up here. Amen. So do we see a little bit clearer, friends? I've shown you multitudes of scriptures tonight. Of course, there's more, but we're out of time for tonight. I am screen recording this and I'll be uploading it on YouTube tomorrow. So you guys can go back and watch these things if you would choose. Amen. So it's all about the old body, the new body. That's it. But people are taking verses out of context and then they're not even quoting them correctly. And they're not reading all the verses beforehand. So they're, so they're, they're being shown all these texts about death and they're like, yeah, but to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That is, that's not what it's saying. <laughs> you see, amen? Amen? And, and friends, I'm not bringing this to you to try to sway you to believe Brother Mike's doctrine. I'm trying to show you what the Bible says. Remember in John chapter 11, when when Jesus, excuse me, was going to raise Lazarus? What did he say to the disciples? I'm going to go and raise him out of sleep. And the disciples were confused thinking, oh, if he's sleeping, he will do well taking rest. And Jesus turned to them and said, Lazarus is dead. So Jesus, our Savior, calls death a sleep. And he says that the only way for you to come out of that sleep is for him to call you out of that sleep. Which he did for Lazarus, right? And at the second coming, he will do for everybody else. With the voice of the archangel, it says, he will call and we will answer. Right? Amen? That's right, Job 14, we covered that earlier as my probably favorite set of texts in the Bible that explain those things, all right? Uh, So the dead are sleeping. Yes, they are unconscious. They don't have any knowledge, no memories. They're not praising God according to the Bible. They are simply in a dreamless, you can say sleep. Essentially, they don't know what's going on, right? The breath of life went back to God. Their bodies went back to the ground and they will remain like that having no knowledge that the living soul is gone. And when Christ descends from heaven, those that died in Christ, he will call them forth and from the grave they will hear and they will be transformed with a new body where they can stand in his presence and not be destroyed. It's beautiful and it's completely biblical. (laughs) All right. Amen. Amen. Uh, Let me see here. Do you remember to answer the emails? Yes, yes. So I have many emails to go through. I'm going to be going through some of them tonight from the last two studies before tonight. I do have all your emails that emailed me, by the way, and I'll be getting back to you with all those that information. Amen. So friends, if you if you've enjoyed this study. Up here where you see my pen, you'll see the three angels gospel ministries. Please consider following by clicking the profile and clicking follow. And you can set your notifications on. I go live Monday, Wednesday, Friday, typically between 6.45 and 7 Eastern time. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, usually around 7 p.m. Eastern time. And then on Saturday, it's typically around 2 p.m. Eastern time. Amen? So four days a week. I'm starting to upload to YouTube now these lives that are more in depth like this one. The little button on my profile, there's a YouTube button that you can click and subscribe. You'll find one of my lives already on there. 
and then I'm going to upload this live, and I actually have another live that I covered about the Antichrist identified, I'm going to end up uploading that too. I have that saved. Amen? As long as I'm not collecting money. No, it's not about money. It's about the, the truth. The, the truth must be given. Simple as that, right? So if people choose to donate, people choose to donate. But I'll never ask for money. Why? Because we're in the last days, right? We're in the last days and people need to know the truth. And why am I talking about this subject tonight? Because one of the two pillars that Satan is going to use to deceive you in these last days, one of them is the immortality of the soul. The spirits of the dead communicating with the living. Because they believe their dead friends, relatives, lovers, whatever, are in heaven, if they're in Christ, they're going to think they're talking to them. Make sense? But they're really talking to fallen angels. They're talking to demons. Everyone who gets cremated goes into the dust. Yes, any person that dies, it doesn't matter how they died or what condition the body is in, they're, they're asleep in the grave. You can DM me. Well, I believe, sister, you already DM'd me already, so you can just go back to that message, right? Amen? So the immortality of the soul, the lie that was told from the garden is being repeated today. Thou shalt not surely die. Thou shalt not surely die, right? And that's being taught today saying that they're not really dead. When they take their last breath, they're still alive somewhere else. That's Satan's lie from the beginning. Amen? Friends, if you want this Bible, I see many of you asking for this Bible, you can send me a direct message. If you click my profile, it'll pop up and you click it again, you can send a direct message. It's a lot easier if you're following. If you follow, you can click my profile, send message, Say, I would like the link to the Bible. Um, if you have any questions about the state of the dead and you want biblical answers, feel free to DM me. If you have a private prayer request, you, I would love to pray for you. Amen. So you can please direct message me. Uh, we do have, by the way, almost forgot to show you. This is on the website, okay? Okay. There's also a, a booklet called Lazarus and the Rich Man or Rich Man and Lazarus, one of the two, right? There's a little booklet on the website that's all about Luke 16. There's also this magazine right here on the website, okay? Let me show you some stuff in here. Let's see. All kinds of stuff, right? Amen. So this is on the website. You can get a free physical copy. It takes you to the page, right? Or a free and or a free digital copy. It's on the magazines page, and then there's a booklet called also on the scripture studies page about about the parable of rich man and Lazarus. Amen. Am I a Jehovah's Witness? No, I'm a Seventh Day Adventist. Amen. Amen. Uh, what do you think about Trump's new Bible? Uh, I don't waste my time with that. I don't waste my time with that. Uh, all that's an illusion and charades. If I was going to get a Bible, it definitely wouldn't be that. <laughs> I can tell you that right now. Amen. <clears throat> amen. Uh, amen for, subs for subscribing. God bless. Thank you. Friends, I want to let you know that I have a passion for the Word of God. I pray that you guys have a passion for the Word of God. I'm so thankful that we had this study tonight. I'm so thankful we had a good turnout tonight. All the scriptures are in, in the video. I'm probably going to upload it tomorrow on YouTube, so please consider subscribing. The YouTube button, again, is on my profile. Uh, you can also check out the website where there's a magazine about the state of the dead, and there's a booklet about uh, the, the parable in Luke 16. Amen? Uh, the YouTube page name is the same. Three Angels Gospel Ministries. Three Angels Gospel Ministries. And you'll find under the playlist, TikTok Live. I have, I have, uh, I just started uploading. You'll find one live on there. And then I'm going to add this one tomorrow. Amen. So friends, let's close with a word of prayer. I know I didn't answer all your questions. 
If I didn't get to your question, it's simply because some of the comments go by really fast. I can't answer everything. Please feel free to send me a direct message with any of your questions, or if you want a link to the Bible that I was using tonight. I will show you really quick the Bible that I was using, just so you have an idea, and then we'll close with a word of prayer. All right? That's the Bible that I'm using. All right? All right? Amen, amen. So if you want any of that information, please send me a direct message. Let's close with a word of prayer. We're going to be live again Friday. Friday, we'll call it right now 7 p.m. Eastern time on Friday. Amen? 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Friday is when we'll be live again. Let's close with a word of prayer. Amen? Heavenly Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I want to thank you. We want to thank you so much for this wonderful study we had tonight. That we discovered the truth from the Bible that was really right in front of us the whole time. And I want to thank you so much for allowing me to be able to present these things in such a way where we are connecting the dots and connecting scriptures together so that we can see the biggest picture, the picture that you have painted in the Bible, so that when we read things that sometimes are confused that they become not so confusing anymore, such as the thief on the cross or the things dealing with the spirits in prison, etc. And we want to thank you that the Holy Spirit was with us tonight, that we were able to rightly divide the word of truth and that those that were in the live were able to learn new things out of your scriptures. I want to pray for everybody tonight and over everybody tonight that if they're struggling with anything, that your Holy Spirit will be sent to them and will guide them away from these things because we are living in the last days. We want to be prepared for the soon coming of our Lord, and we know there's a time of trouble coming, and you want us to gain victory over every known sin, and we can only do that when we behold Christ and Him crucified. I pray tonight that these things will remain in our heart, and I pray that you'll dismiss us with your blessing. For we ask again in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, my brothers and sisters, for joining this evening. Amen to all of you. I pray you enjoyed this study tonight. We'll be back in two days' time with another great study, maybe an open discussion, but we'll be back with another uh, Bible study. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If I don't see you guys in my DMs, I'll see you guys on Friday by God's grace. You guys have a wonderful, blessed night, and keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen. Bye-bye.